Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be made evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Last Sunday, we talked about thinking right, getting the wrong stuff out of our minds and filling it with the right things, good things, godly things, things that are, in fact, true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. I love the two questions we asked at the end of our study last week. I'll remind you of those. Will the things we think about motivate us to do better? Are the things we think about worth sharing with others? We are a world in conflict. We're in a world in conflict with each other and in conflict with ourselves. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul wrote, Do not be anxious about anything. That word anxious literally means to be pulled in different directions. Some translations say, do not worry about anything. The Revised Standard Version says that. The background of our word worry comes from the idea of strangling something. Worry and anxiety still joy from our lives. Paul told the church to rejoice. He told the church to rejoice. Don't be anxious about anything. Now, as one prone to worry, I've often been frustrated with people who say, you just need to stop worrying. We need to get rid of something and replace it with something good. But Paul makes sure that we understand that. Rejoice. Don't be anxious about anything. We need to be a people, Paul says, who pray. If we pray right, then we will find peace with God. But we need to hear Paul's statement correctly. Prayer leads us to peace with God. William Carey puts it this way. He says, Prayer, secret, fervent, believing prayer, lies at the roof of all personal godliness. It is a vital part of a growing, deeper relationship with God. And so, let's talk about what it means to grow in prayer. We'll begin our journey to this deeper prayer life, this study this morning, with the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. It's there Jesus says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We need to make sure we see this statement in the bigger picture, in the correct context. If we look back in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Jesus was concerned not just with doing the right things, but doing the right things for the right reasons. That was the theme as he talked about right giving in chapter 6, verses 2 through 4, and then right praying in chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, and finally, right fasting in verses 16 through 18. God expects us to do the right things, but do the right things 
for the right reasons. Jesus knew his crowd. If you look in verse 2, verse 5, and verse 16, Jesus expected that this would be a group who would give. He expected that this would be a group who prayed, and he expected that this would be a group who would fast. Jesus knew where to start with this group, and he challenged them to do the right things for the right reasons. He challenged them to take their relationship with God to a deeper, more meaningful level. In Philippians, Paul touched on this idea of conflict in our lives. In James chapter 4, we get to expand the discussion even more. James chapter 4, verse 1, James writes, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. That's James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now, actually, if we had the time, we would need to continue this study through the fourth chapter, because James wrote about conflicts with each other. He also wrote about conflicts with God. Uh, The conflict is centered on our pride and our need to humble ourselves before God. In the later part of James chapter 4, James would remind us that sometimes we get a little carried away with our plans for the future. We would be wise to remember that prayer is not telling God what to do, but it is seeking God's will, God's guidance. It is submitting ourselves to that will in our lives. We want to be the people that God has called us to be. If we look back in the first several verses of James chapter 4, we'll find out, we'll be reminded that this conflict brews within us. The answer, James says, is prayer. Prayer that changes us. Prayer that is offered with the right motives. Now, throughout this series of lessons over these few weeks, I'm asking you to join with me in making application in each lesson. Each of us faces unique challenges when it comes to prayer. Uh, Some of us need to pray. That phrase, when you pray, might not actually describe some of us and our prayer life. It might not describe our commitment to prayer. When you ask, does that really describe the right motives we have in approaching the throne of God? Some of us struggle in making time for prayer. That's where I'm reminded of the words of Martin Luther. He says, I have so much busyness that I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. Wow. For some of us, perhaps the greatest test we would face this week is simply to slow down, simply to make time to pray. Perhaps some of the things on our to-do list need to wait until we've had time to properly pray, to properly give time to God, seeking His will and His guidance before we make any moves in the day and in the week ahead. I wonder, will we accept that challenge to make time to pray? Because we desire for the prayer, this phrase, when we pray, we really do desire that phrase, to describe our prayer life. Prayer changes us, there's no doubt about that. Yet we also need to be reminded that prayer changes things. Exodus chapter 32 is one of the many examples in Scripture where men and women of faith approach God. They were seeking to change the outcome of a situation Now, in this particular case of Exodus 32, the Israelites were in hot water because while Moses had been meeting with God on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, the other Israelites had been at the foot of the mountain gathering jewelry to make a golden calf. Now, God was ready to get rid of them and to start all over again. 
I'm reminded of the words of Moses in Exodus chapter 32, verse 13. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Friends, I have been reminded again, of the power of prayer. We pray for people. God heals them. We pray for jobs in our area, and we see God answer that prayer. There are so many things, especially this time of year, as we do tend to pause, to reflect, to look. We are blessed in so many ways. Friends, God has given, God has heard, God has answered. We see these good things happening because we renew our commitment to prayer. But I ask us, though, to do this. Will we humble ourselves before God and do like the disciples did? Will we swallow our pride and ask God to teach us, to really teach us how to pray? Now, I, I know I, I understand many of you who may be studying along with me today that you sit here and go, Johnny, I've prayed all of my life. Yeah, I have too. But I will tell you this, the more I pray, the more I realize, the more I have to learn about prayer. That the more I grow in my relationship with God, the more I recognize the opportunity to grow even more. I'm reminded of the disciples as they went to Jesus in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. We continue our journey into deeper water. We want to think the right things, but we also want to learn how to pray, how to seek God's will, how to humble ourselves as we pray. We want to honor God in every aspect of our lives. Many years ago, there was a a very poor man, but he was a holy man. He lived in a remote part of China. And every day before his time of meditation, in order to show his devotion, he put a dish of butter up on the windowsill as an offering to God, because food was scarce in that area. One day, his cat came in and ate the butter. Now, to remedy this, he began tying the cat to the bedpost each day before his quiet time. This man was so respected for his piety that others joined him as disciples. They worshipped as he did. Generations later, long after this holy man was dead, his followers placed an offering of butter on the windowsill during their time of prayer and meditation. (laughs) Furthermore, each one brought a cat and tied it to a bedpost. (laughs) You know, many of us have learned how to pray, perhaps from a Sunday school teacher, uh, someone that we love dearly, maybe a parent or a grandparent. But we have learned how to pray from great men and women of faith. Now, if you're like me, you were blessed with, because there were those that taught us how to pray and they pointed us to Scripture. That's why verses remind us to pray the right things for the right reasons, the right motives. Those verses, though, are not new to us. They are reminders to us. They are important for us to share with a younger generation who looks at us to teach them how to pray. And may God be praised as we do just that. We want to close our time of study together with prayer. It seems appropriate, doesn't it? 
that if we want to spend this time talking about praying for the right things for the right reasons, then perhaps that would be the best way to close our time together. Let's bow. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful for a new day. We are grateful for this season, a season where our nation stops and pauses. Father, many of us will have opportunity to see family and old friends. Father, bless that time. But I pray that we don't get so caught up in all of the uh, busyness of Thanksgiving that we actually uh, lose sight of the fact that we want to really just stop to slow down and to give you thanks. Father, to give you thanks for the roof over our head, for the clothes on our back, for the food at our table. Father, for the family that is at our side. Father, we have been blessed in so many ways. I thank you, Father, for being part of a community that loves one another, that shares with one another, that helps each other in time of need. I pray, Father, we would all grow in our relationship with you and our relationship with one another. I pray that we would be a people who continually study, who want to seek your will, to live out that plan that you have for us. Father, realizing that in only in doing that will we truly experience life to its full. So we thank you for not giving up on us, for your steadfast love for us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.